Okay, this is part four. Um, let's go to Psalms 1 1. It says, Blessed, happy, fortunate, prosperous, and is the man who walks and lives not in the counsel of the ungodly, following their advice, their plans, and purposes, nor stands submissive and inactive in the path where sinners walk, nor sits down to relax and rest where the scornful and the mockers gather. Okay, and we'll go to um, Ephesians 5, 11 says, Take no part in and have no fellowship with the fruitless deeds and enterprises of darkness, but instead let your lives be so in contrast as to expose and reprove and convict them. You know, sometimes when we read things like that, you know, we look at, we think ungodly or um, those that are in darkness. We think that, you know, God is addressing um, these evil, wicked people that, that we um, have an interpretation for. But, you know, I believe that what God thinks is ungodly is not what we think is ungodly. Or what we think is wicked is different than what God thinks is wicked. And as far as I'm concerned, the way I, I understand God or see God, and which is only just a small little piece of knowledge that I understand Him, is that if it opposes what, what Jesus came and spoke about in the Gospels um, and in the whole world, the whole Word of God, if, if it is opposite of that, if it is not truth, then to God it is ungodly, to God it is darkness, to God it is fruitless, to God it is wickedness. And so in other words, I guess what I'm saying is that if we have man coming and preaching to us another gospel, um, if they are preaching not the true heart of God, then it is ungodly, it is darkness, and it is wicked. That's the way I see it. Okay, so again, um, it has nothing to do with... Um, you know, our understanding of wickedness or ungodliness or, or so forth. Okay, so let's go to 1 John 2.15. It says, Do not love or cherish the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, craving for sensual gratification, and the lust of the eyes, greedy longings of the mind, and the pride of life, assurance in one's own resources or in the stability of earthly things these do not come from the father but are from the world itself so do not love or cherish the world or the things that are in the world if you do the love of the father is not in you if you have placed worldly things in your heart as an idol if you have caused yourself to love or be consumed with worldly things, be it the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, these are not of the Father. I did not say that. The Bible says that. Amen. What is the world? What does it mean, um, the world? Well, it is a place of adorning. It's a place of provision. It means to provide for. We are not called to put our hope or our provision, get our provisions from the things of this life or from the world. When you think about the gospel, um, Jesus sent them out two by two without either purse or scrip, without anything. And he said, if they do not receive you, then shake the dust off your feet. I mean, the truth is, church, that we are to completely and wholly look to God for everything. He is to be our provider. I mean, if the birds of the air do not even know what they're eating, but God looks after them, how much more will he look after us? Amen? So, you know, I think what happens is that the church has gotten herself so caught up in the affairs of this world, looking to the necessities of this life, their pocketbook, their GIC, their, um, all those other things that, um, that she builds up in the natural. And again, is it wrong to do that? Not at all. But if your hope is in that, if your hope is in um, how much money you have in your purse or in your, in your bank account, 
then I think you better think twice because you know what? When the economy crashes, when things go down in this world, who's going to look after you? Well, it's not going to be the mighty dollar. It's going to be God Almighty. Hallelujah. He's the one who will never allow the righteous begging for bread or, or being without uh, food and water. He will look after you. I mean, be thankful that we even have a roof over our head. And sometimes we get so caught up in, in changing things constantly in our house and changing things that we wear. And, and you know, I think God is really dealing with those areas in, in the heart of the church because it, beca it has become a place of materialism. It, it has become a place where we have just so focused on the things that are going to perish, you know, building treasures in this life and, and instead were to build treasures in spiritual things. Amen. Okay, so if we want to move on in our lives, we have to ask him where we need to, to change. We have to ask him to search our hearts. Let's go to Luke 117, chapter 1, verses 17. says, and he himself, actually let's start in verse um, 16, and he will turn back and cause to return many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God, and he himself will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn back the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient and incredulous and unpersuadable to the wisdom of the upright which is the knowledge and holy love of the will of God, in order to make ready for the Lord a people perfectly prepared in spirit, adjusted and disposed and placed in the right moral state. Glory to God. In these last days, there is a spirit of Elijah resting on certain messengers of the gospel, and they are proclaiming a spirit of repentance to the church today. It is a time to get our heart right before God. That, sh that the hearts of the children will, will be turned back to the fathers. Um, and who is this message to? But to the disobedient. And when the Lord gave me this word, I asked him, why does he have a controversy with Zion? And he said, because she is disobedient. So within the church, there are those who are obedient. Within the church, there are those who are disobedient. And this controversy is to those who are um, unpersuadable because they choose to hang on to foundations of error. They choose to hang on to gods and idols that they have erected in their hearts that, um, that do not belong to the true gospel. So God is going to deal with um, the disobedient, and that is what he's doing. And he will bring judgment, and he will bring the fire of his presence on those people to persuade them to come back into his uh, truth and into his fold. The word disobedient there means unpersuadable. It is the word contempumasis, con which means obstinately rebellious. It means disbelief, rebellious, especially against lawful authority, an order or court. It means to be stubborn. And the church for the most part, is stubborn. She is being obstinate because obviously this is a word that's going forth out of God's heart and he's seeing that and he's, um, he's directing it to the disobedient. So if your heart, if you feel you have erected idols in your heart today, I, I just ask that you would um, ask the Lord to come and search your heart. You know, it's okay. We all, we all have areas of our heart that need to be dealt with and God wants to deal with those areas. He wants to bring us into a place of obedience, a place of holy living, a place of righteous living, because he is a righteous God, and he doesn't want any to perish, amen? So um, I just encourage you to, um, to let your hearts be soft and pliable before God. Um, let's go to Romans 10, 21, says, But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. That word gainsaying there is the word um, contrast or opposite. There is a contrast in the church, and that's what God's dealing with. And um, we have to be willing to change. Amen. We're going to continue in the next segment, and we'll see you in segment five. <laughs>